My name is Sherry Coelho, and I'm 50, I think I'm 57 now. Today is September 21st, 2015, and we're in Sacramento, California. And I'm here with my dear friend, Betty Lippincott, and um, I think she'll continue the rest. My name is Betty Lippincott. I'm 62 at last check. Today's date is September 21st, 2015. We're in Sacramento, California, and I am here with my partner in crime, my best friend, Sherry Coelho. <laughs> I'm honored. Okay, Betty, what is your first memory of me? <laughs> A rather intimidating teacher at the front of the classroom in our myth class at CRC, Cosumnes River College. And uh, what, what made me so intimidating? That's my other self, you know that, that mask. So what, what tell more. I had a tendency <laughs> to be intimidated by teachers in general until I got to know them. I was just returning to college after... Um, a long absence and uh, decided to go ahead and work on uh, some gen ed courses for a degree but first I wanted to get my feet wet in something fun and comfortable and the myth class had sounded interesting in the past but it was never at the right time so one the subject was intriguing but I had no idea what to expect what kind of workload to expect and then I'm sitting in this room of other people and we're all just kind of waiting for you to finish writing the stuff on the board of what we were going to be doing. And I'm looking at the amount of books in, in my bag <laughs> for one class and thinking, oh boy. Of course. <laughs> but once you started talking and got the class going with a dramatic reading, from poetry and myth, it uh, it took away some of that intimidation. Part of my objective. <laughs> <laughs> so, my first memory of you was as a student, of course, and um, I was teaching at the time. This is two thousand five, so this is ten years it's ago when we first met um, as teacher and student, and. Um, I was teaching Mythologies of the World, my favorite class that inspires and nourishes me in my job. And um, I remember you distinctly and quietly sitting. I think you were in the front. And, um, yeah, I mean, part of it was is my goal wasn't to intimidate, it, intimidate, but certainly to try to engage people. But I really didn't want people that didn't want to be there anyway. So hit them hard, hit them fast, and then we get down to our ideal sacred 12 in that myth class, which inevitably has happened over the past 24 years of teaching this subject. So anything else you want to say about that? <laughs> I think that was part of the intimidation factor when you started going through the syllabus and identifying all those criteria. <laughs> <laughs> that um, spelled success in the class. And mm. when you've been that long out of the classroom, mm -hmm. you begin questioning your ability to keep up. Mm -hmm. Even when you know instinctively that you can, you question it. Sure. And yeah. it, there's that moment of doubt. And then when we started looking at the homework assignments, <laughs> then I thought, who is this woman? <laughs> Uh, yeah, was, but I found good. out. So what did you find out? I mean, we've, be fun, we've become dearest friends, and so I think we were both, I think I was, what, 47 at the time, mm -hmm. and you were about my age now, yeah. or younger, yeah, 10 years ago. So I found out that you were all heart, all passion, not just for the subject, but for your students. Um, I can't picture a teacher caring more about her students than what you were demonstrating. When anyone struggled, uh, you tried to help them. You gave them the resources that they needed, even if you were bloodying their paper with red ink on 
whether it's a test or an essay, you were always peppering it with the positive comments and encouragement to weed out, to pull out um, the, the best part of them, even if they didn't see it. And I think that's where we clicked. Um, when I faltered the most, that's where you were the biggest booster. You, it's like you had, you were a fan club. But Betty, you didn't ever really <laughs> falter. I mean, the thing about your writing, too, is that as loquacious as it was, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> is there were always some provocative, pithy seed of depth and of idea and interaction with these texts. And so, especially your story of Pilar that I remember, which is really, I think, a narrative account of your blossoming, you know, in midlife. But it came through in your, really, your response to some of these sacred stories. And I use the word sacred because we deal, as you know, with these texts from all over the world that resonate and have, have nourished people for so many years and so much. And so that, for me, is why this, as you know, this myth class is so significant, not only as, you know, it's a, I can't believe I'm paid to do this job sometimes. <laughs> but what I noticed about your writing is, is in its evolution from these simple dialectic responses that we did to the essays, there was this, this development of self that I saw and your prose was never really prose. It was poetic and it was these implications of ideas and the way you could tease together ideas and weave them in. So it became a joy to read your work. And it's because of, I think, you of all those people, I think, since our class got down to, I think, 11 that semester yes. <laughs> of the survivors. <laughs> um, yeah. And that was two years before my mom died. And about that yes. time... Your father-in-law was was uh, going through his time of need. So <laughs> tell me, say it. <laughs> what do we talk about after class? <laughs> I mean, one of the things about you, Betty, too, is that even though I, w I really saw you as being this extraordinary mind and is I remember that because of these issues that you were having at home, there were some times when you couldn't come to class or you were struggling and I was trying to, you know. And so it got to a point where we ended up talking about catheters quite a bit. It was a catheters. challenge sometimes to <laughs> be able to finish assignments because it felt like there was just so much um, emotional turmoil and actual just physical day-to-day -day life living going on um, between different family members, in particular my father-in-law, uh, bless him, he's, he's uh, gone into what you call the great recycling. The great recycling. Um, he <laughs> was one of my big cheerleaders as well, but at the same time, during his time of need, it took a lot of, of energies. He would, it's hard to focus on your homework when you've got somebody who's sitting there staring at you. <laughs> waiting for you to stop what you're doing and not saying a word, just staring. And so I reached the point, I'd just say, okay, I'll just not do my homework right now. I would do it later. And then I'd fall asleep and not do it. And then I'd get to class. It's like, sorry, I don't have anything but, to turn in. But you were honest. That's <laughs> the thing, too, is after class. And I remember my feeling, which is a question I wanted to ask you, too. Is there a time that you didn't like me and me you? It wasn't necessarily like but it was more um i just i mean the loquacious script came out after classes there were details yes. that we would sh that you would share with me that i thought i i really don't have time to and i was getting because i'm you know as you know hyperactive anyway but it's because i didn't <laughs> understand some of the things you were going through in your private life, because I saw you on a day-to-day -day as a teacher. I didn't mm -hmm. see the masks that you wear the rest of the time, uh, that you were a daughter going through the same things with your mom. It wasn't until another class that I had taken from you um, 
where same thing it was you know, a lot of uh, ups and downs that, uh, going through in my personal life but another student in the class had told me that you were having some problems uh, with your mom's health and so I, I was concerned there so anyhow one day after class we uh, were walking towards your office and we started Talking uh, sitting about, down on the, yeah, the ground grass. out front of the building, and we were. Uh, you first, you were telling me about your mom's condition. She had gone into the hospital, and um, another infection uh, connected with the uh, catheter, <laughs> and we wound up because in my growing up, my mom, bless her, was one of these people that you've got to find things to laugh about no matter how <laughs> trying it is. And so we, I joked about, oh, yes, I understand completely. I says with my father-in-law, I, I'm not like some girls that worry about the three C's of a diamond ring. I'm worried about the three C's of catheter care. Oh, God. It's the, you know, <laughs> know. the clarity and the color. And, you know, oh. It's things like that because I know. Uh, he was prone to infections because of the catheter as well. And it's just when you're a caregiver as well as a family member yeah. and you're having to embrace that you're related but at the same time yeah. kind of put that emotional distance so this that is you your can take care father-in-law betty yes, this my, is your <laughs> my husband had already passed away mm -hmm. and um my father-in-law i promised him i'd be uh caring for him mm -hmm. uh forever and and he cared for me just as much uh in different ways but it was just the idea that Here's something that is so personal of a nature of, of hygiene that as a child that you tell yourself that you're going to deal with these things, but when you're actually physically Ugh. doing it, it puts a whole different image on it. And the only thing you can do in a situation like that sometimes is not cry about it, not scream and, and get frustrated, but just find a way to joke about it. And you and I found that. Well, the and clarity of catheter care yes. really <laughs> resonated that day, and I it, think. It because put a smile on your face. <laughs> I think, and that's, I think, when we became, I mean, something shifted, shifted. right about that time. So that was maybe 2006, I think. Yes. Because in 2000. Seven, my mom actually did, as I say, go through the great recycling, as she would say, get rid of this damn body. Yes. But at any rate, she um, she passed away, and it was you and another student that taught that myth class for a solid week. Because um, yes. River College, we had hired a sub. But of course, the sub, as English teachers, um, we aren't trained to really delve the depths of this mythological tradition. Um, I have that training because I went back and got a degree in mythology. So that's my love and my passion and my skill. So, And the students really knew more about the subject than the teachers did. So you and Nicholas um, taught the class while the sub sat in the back and just sat there. And so it was kosher that way. But the two of you took control of the class. And I remember right when my, during my mom's um, funeral. And right after that, getting a call from you, because I had to know how that myth class was going. That was my concern <laughs> is my, my, I mean, my, yeah, I mean, it was one of those were this precious group of people, you know, you and Nicholas and the other students that were, I just did not want this class to be canceled for this week. And I think my family would understand. My mom certainly would, but you taught it. And how was it to do that class for? I mean, you, you it, and it was exhilarating. You I, I can't think of a better gift than, unfortunately, under the times that it was. But it was a gift to be able to mentor the students, and to work with Nicholas, and um, knowing that we had the safety belt, the 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 crutches, training wheels of the official teacher in the yeah. classroom. But she just sat there like a fly on the wall, letting us. <laughs> take control and work with the students and to see the respect that they gave us in mm -hmm. turn and understanding what you were going through mm -hmm. um, this all of the class uh, had great compassion for what you were dealing with 
And I remember as I was walking out to the parking lot and had already said goodbye to Nicholas. And, and as I was saying goodbye to him, I says, well, I need to get out to the car and get my cell phone turned back on. I says, if I don't call Sherry, no matter what's going on at her end, I've got to call her and let her know and leave a, a voice message so that she understands the class well. Just, uh, I mean, <laughs> otherwise, I would burn in the underworld. <laughs> fry, skewered on sharpened number two pencils. Myth in English hell. But yes, uh, no, that I think, was the first thing was to let you know that it was okay. And then it shifted. I think those, by that time you'd already finished the class anyway, but you would yes. come back just to, just to be there, just to yes. be present. And I remember, and over the years, you always provided just you coming into the class. And the class usually was is taught in the fall from yes. seven. So it was that magical time of the death of light and the birth of darkness. And we would be together and uh, you and the other students and... You know, talking about Joseph Campbell's influence in mythological traditions <laughs> and how relevant the subject is in all of our lives and how nourishing it is. And I think that's what really, I don't know, morphed into something, aside from the death of loved ones right around that time, right. is you, know, you were dis- determining whether or not you really wanted to go back. You were back in school, but whether you wanted to complete it as a bachelor's degree. And with me, I just really wanted to keep teaching myth and having you in my life as this extraordinary person who's become more of a mentor to me. I mean, the joke I think with us now is you've become the teacher. You've become my guru and my best friend. And during the serial monogamy of relationships that I've had (laughs) since that time, (laughs) the most recent one, (laughs) really, I could call you day or night and cry if I needed to and you never hesitated I mean you had your family issues to deal with but you never because I was not a family member per se I think you called me your little sister I think now and I'm so privileged that you include me and in your family that way but you never denied me you never said I'm busy ever and just listened you know, with objectivity and, you know, would verbally smack me upside the head when I needed it. <laughs> Stomp your toe occasionally, you know, verbally. <laughs> it's wield your own red pen in your own ways. But um, I think that's part of really that you've, you've been, and I think especially how difficult and challenging it is to have, you know, a, other just friends at this time of our lives because we're, so, I mean, I'm full on career. I never, I've been divorced for 19 years. I never had children partially because I chose to go full on into this career, partially out of fear, the dumb and ugly mask and going into college and doing exceptionally well and being this dynamic teacher that I still hope I am and never allowed that latitude for family. And you did the opposite. You have two beautiful daughters and six grandkids and you're this wonderful matriarch of this family that you nourish and protect. And I'm kind of, you know, kind of the opposite. But if that's how, what I think draws me to you is you're this, you've done the things that I thought I didn't ever want, have children, have a family. And it is a small regret, but I knew I didn't have enough energy. I think it's at this point that I kind of, dip my head to my shoulder and scuff my toe in the dirt and say oh shucks but (laughs) you you are the teacher that I already had hoped that I could be at that point that the reason I'd gone back to school was to finish a degree toward Mm. becoming a teacher as things evolved it turns out um, especially especially working with the myths and working with the philosophies that Joseph Campbell was um, putting forth, was seeing myself through my own eyes and not somebody else's. I had been the mom and the grandma and the wife and the daughter and the daughter-in-law and all these other masks that we wear, The as you pointed out so beautifully, the family is so much of who and what I am 
And when I first had the dream of becoming a teacher, it was through the eyes of a young woman who thought, my husband is always preparing me that what if something happens to him? Mm. And he kept working to make sure that I would be cared for. And I thought, you know, if something happens to him, I better be prepared to care for myself yeah. as well. Yeah. And so I thought, I always thought teaching was such a wonderful thing. My biggest influences as a child growing up were specific teachers that influenced me. And here I was back in college to finish out this goal, meeting somebody who went from being this intimidating teacher that I then saw as just like me as I got to know you and saw your frustrations, your um, own intimidations that you faced, your own shyness yeah. as yeah. outgoing and exuberant as you are in front of the classroom, your <laughs> teacher mask, as you always called it. When you got into your office, you were every bit as shy, if not more so, than I was and uh, hurt by the same things and and overjoyed by the same types of things. And I began seeing you entirely different. That is where I started seeing the potential for a friend. And, and those days that I'd get so <laughs> frustrated and angry, I was supposed to give these things to her. She's not answering the phone. Oh, where is yeah. she? And, but then every time I would remember that voice in the back of my head, that one day where you were telling me, in um, a moment of, of quiet reflection that you felt like you weren't a good friend because you didn't return calls and stuff like that, that all of a sudden it, it dawned on me, wait a minute, she's not returning my call because she, she's not my friend. She's not returning the call because she's got things going on. And so then I would say, okay, let it go. And so sometimes it might be a few weeks before we would talk to each other, mm -hmm. but we would talk, we would connect and reconnect and reconnect weeks and weeks and months and months. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, wait a minute, that is what a friendship is. It's not the measure of time between yeah. our connections, but each time we reconnected, it was like there had been no gap. <laughs> and that's when I began to realize that, um, the philosophy that my mom and dad raised us with is that we don't measure our family by our blood. It's by our relationships. And you were the closest I had to a baby sister. My baby <laughs> sister had passed away years ago. And I've, I've got baby brothers, but anyhow, the, you were the embodiment of if my sister had grown up that, you know, I picture her, you know, being someone as generous and giving but like I said, you were the teacher that I had dreamed of being, but through knowing you, through knowing the myths, and by visiting the classroom repeatedly, I was always learning things new that it's like, wait a minute, I sat through this last year. <laughs> this is something new yet again. And also through the eyes of all the other students, I began to realize that I don't, have to be a teacher to be a teacher that yeah. I'm I'm finding my own path and that it's okay to let go of a, a old dream because it allows for the new ones to come to the surface and it allows the dream of when I started I was coming from one perspective how do I I, I need to reach this goal for all these outside external mm. reasons. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I have this opportunity to find a goal that's for me and me alone. I remember and it was I'm, that movie Finding Joe. Yes. It the was Epiphany. <laughs> it was I remember the film Finding Joe and yes. you know partially based on the mythical uh, mythological traditions that Joseph Campbell, you know, extraordinary teacher that he was and yes. still is. Um it really, that, that film, I think when I showed it that day, I'd just seen an excerpt of it, and I decided to show the myth class, and I'd invited you back. Yes. And I think this has been, what, three years now? Yes. It's so 2012? Yes. 
And I hadn't seen the whole film. And as we were watching, because typically in the classroom, this becomes our sacred space. And and, and these students get this. You know, I always tell them, this is a re- this is a precious time. You're nourishing yourselves. You know, this education, this phenomenal opportunity to grow and to and nobody can take this away, but particularly this class, of course, <laughs> and <laughs> of course. And when I showed that film, and the whole premise was, as Campbell talked about, which comes from the Upanishads, this follow your bliss. This is what wasn't a Campbellian coined phrase necessarily, even though people attribute it to him. He was just a great redactor of ideas. He's not a mystic, I'm sorry, like what people say, but he was a fantastic teacher. And then the premise of that was follow your bliss. Well, how do you do that? It's all about the quest this this journey from birth to death and the little mini quests that we experience daily, if not hourly, even momentarily. And then this notion of what are we looking for ultimately? It's our own backyards, like in The Wizard of Oz. Yes. Is home is right here, but we have to take the journey first. And so I think when that film was being shown... Something was said during that film because I could see you physically shift. You were sitting next to me taking notes. And I think it had to do something along those lines is that epiphany occurred that you had been brewing, had been maybe inadvertently, subconsciously thinking anyway. You were you had gone back to school online, so you actually were starting, continuing the bachelor's degree after mm-hmm. Kasumnas. Yes. And it was expensive. And taking away time from your family, they, you know, you had this li- wonderful little boy, your grandson, your youngest grandson, who had been born just a couple of years prior, who lives with you, and I, you wanted to spend time with them, you know, this this hero quest just in your own house with this these players that became your family, but no, you were in there on the, your computer in your room, doing work, homework for this online class or several online classes. And that day you had come, because I kept begging you, come and watch, you know, come hang out with us in the myth class. And you sh- you actually physically shifted. And I remember at the end of that film looking at me, and I thought you were mad. <laughs> <laughs> because I had been, I almost felt guilty, because after my mom died and I inherited some money, I wanted to help pay for your education, because I don't have children, and I knew how important this was, and we talked about that. And... I remember you said somewhere around that time you didn't want to disappoint me by stopping, by just, you're done with this formal education, which after that film, I think we had that chat, is I'm not going to continue. For, I think it's Fort Hayes? Fort Hayes State University yeah, out yeah. of uh, Kansas. Mm-hmm, that you were taking online. And you didn't want to tell, you told your family, and I remember feeling a little hurt and a little, a little jealous because, you know, I love you so much as my dear precious friend, sister friend, and I, again, having an older brother, I never really had a family, and my parents were quite a bit older than me, and so having this sister friend, and you didn't want to tell me of this decision, that you were going to stop this pursuit of this bachelor's degree, that since I had known you had had been such an important goal, and you let it go and have embraced this journey now of this family that lives, you have various extended family members, immediate family members that live with you for a variety of reasons, three generations living in this one house. And you're the matriarch in this, this hub, and this has become the degree without the degree. You've earned it, and that's something I never, I never did. You know, it's and won't have. But um, I have a question, though. I'm wondering, where do you think we'll be in 10 years? I mean, I'll be 67, and you'll be, let me say, I can't, a mathematical moron. <laughs> <laughs> 72? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, in 20 would, years, you know. <laughs> I would hope that we're still taking turns at each other's kitchen table and sharing stories just 
enjoying each other's company, enjoying each other's family, uh, however way we define family at that yeah. point in time. Um, uh, you know, I think back, the reason why it was so hard to tell you is when I had tried to tell you before that I was trying to, to stop working on the formal education, mm -hmm. um, you were disappointed and you kept trying to talk me out of it. And, I oh, never I trying to, to talk you. <laughs> and I never took and it that, that way. And that was the first time you had offered to pay for my education. Mm. And I remember going home and telling my sister and my daughter, I can't let her do that. I don't know if this is the path yeah, that's was right meant for, you. for me. Um, but I was trying to find the language <laughs> that you would understand. And watching that video, it dawned on me the language is right there. But you know just what? Like I, I just, <laughs> I think I, I got to say this because <laughs> I think because it had been so many years that this was such an emphatic goal for you that. It didn't occur to me that such, because, again, maybe that film, that one day, really provided that crossing the threshold to, I found my gold at the end of this journey, and that is where I started for you. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, if I had been, and I think I, I you maybe I wasn't it. hearing it, you're right. But, but you got it that day. I got it that day, but because it had been such an objective and I think if I had heard that this was really, because I never really had a clue that this may not be the path because you were so doggedly, even after you, you dropped some of those classes at Fort Hayes, you still ordered the books because you were going to take some classes anyway. I so I never was give, convinced. <laughs> I gave myself the gift of one final year to make sure yeah. that am I just tired or Am I actually feeling yeah, yeah. who I am and who I'm, what my path is meant to be? And what I it think is that's now. what it is, is mm -hmm. that I gave myself permission to divorce an old me yeah. Yeah. to make room for the new me. That death and resurrection exactly. that we talk about in the myth class all the time, shedding that old skin. That's your caterpillar. Yes. And, and, and evolving to the butterfly. That, the, you saw the look on my face, and mm -hmm. you saw the moment. And, and I do remember. I had tears in my eyes. Yeah. It's like, this is it. And you you knew. It, because you kept looking at me like, I get it. You had that well, look I, on that your you face. Well, that you got it, and that, yeah, it was. But you understood yeah, what yeah. I was feeling yeah. at that, that magical point. Well, I think because it was more of an actual physical manifestation, because you know, you you bite even as you smile, or you smile as you bite. You know, <laughs> you and I have never had a full blown argument, or you know, kind of no, heated discussion. <laughs> but I can really feel it. You'll look at me with that smile, <laughs> and you'll say something <laughs> sweetly. And you do this with your family too. And I thought, you just do not want to cross Betty. You know, it's like <laughs> I think I call that mommy mode. <laughs> is it? I don't know. <laughs> You know, is there anything, do you think we'll ever lose track of touch? I don't think we'll ever lose touch of you, each, the, each other. I, I don't think so. I can't picture losing track of you any more no. than I could picture losing track of my sisters. Yeah. Um, you're part of my family. You're part of my heart. <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> There's tissues over there. Right here. You, you always will be a part of me. Um I've got only a couple friends I've had over my lifetime that had that kind of energy in my life. And even when there's extreme gaps of time from when we've spoken with each other, it didn't erase the feeling that we shared when we did connect. Yeah. And because of the physical proximity, I know that we'll see each other. But even if we wind up moving across country or across the world, I can't picture that we'd be without each other in our lives. We're threads in the same fabric, gal pal. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if you had a husband or 20 husbands down the line. Uh, well, if the know? serial monogamy keeps going, it just might be that way. I don't know. Is there anything that you've 
always wanted to tell me but haven't? I'm curious. <laughs> Just be honest. Come on, say it. Now's no, your chance. No matter what you think about yourself, your abilities, your capabilities, your energies, you are a beautiful person. You are an inspiring person. And I've told you before, your children, and I want you to believe it with all my heart, your children are all of the students that you have influenced the way you've influenced me. Don't perpetuating the, <laughs> perpetuating the memes rather than the genes, so to speak. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. You have children. You didn't birth them, but you did give a rebirth to them in an energetic way. Thanks, Betty. <laughs>